Good morning, one and all. I am laying it all on the line today. I am not going to hold anything back. I'm probably going to get in trouble. In fact, I know some of the things I'm about to tell you will get me in trouble with other social media influencers. It'll get me in trouble with some of the companies I work with, but I am done caring. Here's the facts, you guys. I grew up dirt floor poor. Not just poor, but one of the places I lived in had a freaking dirt floor. And the number one thing that I'm concerned about is you guys and not sponsors, not companies, not what people think of me anymore. And the reason that is, is because you guys are meeting me. You're coming up to me at trade shows. You're coming up to me at the gas station, at Menards, at Red Lobster, and saying thank you for the videos. It helped me. It changed me. It helped me grow my business. And that means everything in the world to me. I want you guys to succeed. So I'm going to lay it all on the line. I'm going to tell you things that nobody else is going to tell you because they're too afraid to tell you or they have something involved personally like their own money that could be pulled away if they, re if they let these secrets out. Now we're going to go bass backwards today. We are going to go from the absolute worst way that you can make money in the green industry to the absolute best way you can make money in the green industry. And the last company on this list, I'm going to use as an example, went from zero dollars to over a billion, with a B, billion dollars in nine years. I am not joking. So we're gonna lay this all on the line. Make sure you stick around to the very end because it gets crazy good. The profits get un freaking real but let's dive into today's video and if you're wondering where i'm at this is my green room this is my personal sanctuary the sanctum sanctorium if we were if i was dr strange and i am a little strange and i don't give a crap anymore i'm done caring but this is where i come to decompress so if you guys have a room where you go to decompress i'd love to hear what you do to like if i don't if i'm not in here i'm hitting the gym because i got all this energy and it's got to get out some way, shape, or form. So <laughs> let's take it to the next level. Let's start with the number one worst way you can make money in the green industry. All right, the number one worst way you can make money in the green industry is cutting lawns, mowing grass, making tall grass short. That is the absolute phenomenal race to the bottom. There is no worse way for a guy to make a living than doing that. And let me just lay this all on the line for you. Before, but before you go throwing your lawnmowers away, don't do that. Because although just cutting grass is a phenomenally terrible way to make a living, there's an aspect, a component to cutting grass that actually hits in the number four segment of the best way to make a living. But here's why just cutting grass is a race to the bottom. The average lawn mowing guy is charging between $1 and $2 per minute. The problem is the average lawn mowing guy doesn't know business at all. And that guy is your competition. The guy that doesn't understand how to run a business is out competing you, but he's racing to the bottom. So for you to be able to compete with that guy that doesn't understand how to allocate for overhead, doesn't understand how to take into account all of the additional expenses that at the end of the year add up like a juggernaut and just destroy them, is competing for the same dollars that you are. Here's what the mind frame is. Even let's say it's a dollar a minute, which is horrible. And you can say, wait a minute, dirt monkey, a dollar a minute, $60 an hour. I wouldn't mind making $60 an hour. <laughs> You're not making $60 an hour, trust me, you guys. You're not even coming close to that because you've got your phone expense, you've got your fuel, you've got your insurance. You've got all of that time that you're not allocating for. You're out sharpening lawnmower blades in the evening. Who's paying you to sharpen your lawnmower blades in the evening? Who's paying you to invoice? If you're invoicing and you're doing it, get an automated system. But who's paying you? Nobody. But now if you wanted somebody else to do that for you, would they do it for free? No, nobody's gonna do these things for you for free. So what happens is, is 
you guys that are just cutting grass are doing so much work for free and you're not even realizing that if you had to hire somebody else for that aspect of the business, you'd have to pay them for it, but you're not paying yourself for it. All you're paying yourself is for the time you actually spend on the lawn. And if it's not you, it's your competition. And when your competition is thinking like that, that means they're outbidding you. Even at $2 an hour, if you call, if you, or $2 a minute, that adds up to $120 an hour. That's still barely a livable wage by the time you take the cost of the mowers, the cost of the trailer, the cost of your marketing, the cost of your insurance, the time you spend in the evenings doing things, the time you're trying to fix your truck, the time you're trying to fix your trailer, all of these minutia add up to make it a not profitable aspect. But again, I say, don't throw your mowers away because there is an aspect to cutting lawns that makes it very profitable, a very lucrative business. And here's where I said, I'm gonna get in trouble with, earlier I said, I'm gonna get in trouble with other social media influencers because they want you to go out and cut lawns because they want you to watch and follow along and learn and grow, but they're not really making their living off from cutting lawns. They're making their living off from you watching them cutting lawns and the sponsors watching you watch them and then giving them free stuff, paying them, doing that, but that's never disclosed. It's just not disclosed. It's not talked about, it's not disclosed. But that's really where a lot of these guys are making their living, which is perfectly fine. Kudos to them. But the problem is, is if they're not saying, giving you a clear picture and being very transparent about how they make their money. I'm going outside. Gracie loves talking when I'm talking. If they're not being very clear on how they make their living, well, then is that fair to you? I don't think it is. I really want you guys to succeed. I came from absolutely nothing. And... The only way that I was able to succeed is by people giving me the real truth, not sugarcoating it, because every time you sugarcoat something, you take something away from another person. So the number one worst way to make a living is by making tall grass short. Let's go to number two. Now number two worst way to make a living in the green industry used to be my number one way I made a living in the green industry and it was very profitable. But times change, people change, things change. And here's the thing, this is all relevant to my neck of the woods. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, this is my market, this is my area. The number two worst way to make a living is in demolition. Here's why. It used to be that there was a few of us that really knew how to do demolition. The competition wasn't there, but then the roll-off companies, the companies that we use to create, to, to put our product in, the dumpsters, think of the dumpsters. Those guys started to look and go, ha, ah, wait a minute. These guys are making more money than we are. Is there another aspect, another way that we can optimize and capitalize on what they're doing? And these roll-off companies, oh, they had the secret formula because we, ex we demolition contractors gave it to them. When we would go out and demolish a house or a building like this, we would need 240 yard dumpsters. So the roll-off company would go, all right, well, all they're doing is they're demoing this building. They look at the building and they go, all right, they needed 240 yard dumpsters and we're getting paid for the 40 yard dumpsters. But now if we just bring a skid loader out, it takes them four hours to demo it. They know how long the dumpsters are there because the, dem the uh, demolition companies are going, hey, drop off 240 yard dumpsters, bring them, get rid of them by the next day. And they're looking at that and going, all right, well, all we need to do is a skid loader for a day and we're already providing the dumpsters. So we're getting a double bonus off from the top of this thing. So demolition in my neck of the woods became a clear cut race to the bottom, but it's, it's almost in line with the number three worst way to make a living. All right, number three, the number three worst way to make a living. And I say these are the worst because there isn't a lot of profits in these. One, two, three, excavation, general excavation, common excavation, not select excavation, not excavation that requires a high degree of level or skill, but I'm talking about digging a basement, digging a foundation, doing general excavation for the home industry 
is a race to the freaking bottom that is almost, it is the same as, as uh, demolition. It's terrible. You know, back in the day, I had a crew that was digging five basements a week. And we, I had two dump trucks running. We were hauling fill. We were constantly digging. We were doing job after job after job. And I bid those basements, digging a square box in the ground at $5,500 per basement. That was the dig. That was with uh, you know some of the other components involved in it. Do you know what the price today is to dig that same basement? This was 18 years ago. Today, that price is $5,500. And the reason is, you see these toys right here? They're fun. And a lot of guys wanted to buy a toy like that. And that's how I got started. And, and I, bought, I wanted a toy, but I needed to pay for that toy. And these guys came in and again, these guys, they're not always thinking about their numbers. They're not always thinking about the best, most profitable way to do things. They just want an excuse to own that thing right there. And I don't blame them. But the problem is, is this competition increased, the profits decreased and it became a, a third race to the bottom. But I'm going to put a but in here. The but is excavation associated with utility work is still lucrative. Excavation associated with site development is still lucrative. Excavation associated with a specialty skill like grading is still profitable. There's still profit margins where you, you're not just out digging a box in the ground. You've got to have some knowledge to it in, in the category five, which becomes one of the category four, which is coming up next is proof where the more skill you have, the more profit you will make doing that thing. So when we go into excavation, we're going to break it down into two components, common excavation, which is digging a hole in the ground, sticking your laser up going, here we go or specialty excavation, which you still have those same profit margins that you had back in the day, which are good, good profit margins. Now let's get into the next category, which starts to tick tock up on your profits. It starts to get good with category four and it gets insane with category five. Oh, before we jump into category four, there's two other things I forgot to mention about excavation. A lot of people love to dig ponds. It requires no skill. You just gotta have enough common sense that you don't bury your excavator in the muck in the side of a pond. But digging a pond is one of the easiest flipping things you can possibly ever do because nobody can see your results. Your bucket, your boom is underwater. You've got to demuck a pond. Just don't bury your excavator while you're doing it. So it's so fun to dig a pond and flop the dirt around because you're not trying to cut to a certain elevation and you're not trying to bench it out and get your footings just set and dig all this stuff and do all this technical stuff. You're just moving sticks all day long. It's like a kid trying to get play a claw game and trying to get his prize out of the machine. That's what digging a pond is. So you're not gonna make a lot of money, but it's one of those marginal things because con people don't understand about it, but typically you're not making money because of where you are located. And this is where I said the two things I need to talk about. Pond, digging ponds, mass digging nature ponds, but it's the location as well. I'm in the urban area. Now what I can charge for excavation here is almost double or triple what I can charge if I'm out in the country. It's a huge difference. So your location for all of these things that we're talking about, your price will depend on your location. I have central, I don't want to live in the city. I don't want to live here. I hate the freaking city. I have eight acres of land in the heart of the city because my wife realized that if I didn't have some land so I could walk out on my back deck and take a leak without worrying about somebody seeing me, I would lose it, okay? So that's why I have so much land inside of the city. But the reason I live in the city too is because the profits are insane in the city. The deeper you go into the heart of the city, the more money you can typically make for a service. Now I said ponds, excavating for ponds is one of those things, 
But here's we here's where it gets weird. Ponds tie in with category four, which is one of the most profitable as well. But hear me out. There's a major difference between just digging a nature pond and demucking it and building a specialty pond, a decorative pond, an aesthetic pond. But I'm getting ahead of the game. So let's back this boat up and dive into category four. Category four is hardscape construction. Pavers, retaining walls. Now the profit margins on hardscape construction are dipping as more people enter the pool. But it's still relatively good if you can separate yourself from the pack and create yourself as an expert in the industry. Someone tried and true that knows what they're doing. Again, you've got to take it to the next level to separate yourself from the herd. But hardscape construction is still a very lucrative segment of the green industry for now and the reason why hardscape construction is still lucrative is because a it's hard work it's not easy doing this stuff b it requires a certain amount of equipment overhead c here's where it gets really good is when you go to build a retaining wall or you put in a patio paver or something like that you've got to allocate for your materials You've got to know how many block you're going to use, what the price of that block is. You got to know what the rock is. You got to know what the excavation is going to cost. You got to know how much material you're hauling out. What I'm basically doing right now, you guys, is spitting out a bunch of numbers. And the typical hardscape guy is going to realize pretty fast if they don't start to get their numbers dialed in, they're going to either go out of business really fast or the customer is going to get one hell of a deal on their project. So it forces, hardscape forces contractors to analyze their numbers. Now, if a contractor started to analyze their numbers on categories one, lawn mowing, category two, category three, excavation demolition, if he was analyzing his numbers and forced to, he would realize pretty quick he wasn't making any money. Category four, hardscapes and patios and anything. Here's where I'm going back to category one with the lawn care. Anything that is a specialty job, you will have higher profit margins. Now we're going category four hardscaping construction. I consider a specialty category. Anytime you specialize, you will have better profits. So if you are a lawnmower guy, don't throw your lawnmower out because your lawn mowing customer is your money maker right there. Here's where category one and four tie together. Air core aeration, dethatching, pesticide application, fertilizing. Your typical lawn mowing customer wants a lot more done than just having their tall grass short. Let's take it look take a look at my yard here for an instance. My dogs chew my yard up. I don't really care. I'm not ashamed of it. They enjoy it. Life's too short for me to worry about having a perfect pristine yard. But as we look at it, if I was mowing this yard, I would be saying, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, look at, we've got a bare spot here. We really should do some core aeration right there to loosen up that soil so that we can get a more evened out lawn. We've got some patchwork over here. We may have a grub infestation. Basically what I'm telling you guys to do is upsell, upsell, upsell. Leverage your existing customer base that you got from making tall grass short into a much higher profit center. Um, and it's all of those specialty things which, which take it to the next level. Here's a real world example in the numbers. I'm trying to throw as many numbers out as I can at you guys. The numbers I actually used when I would go in back in the day when we first started mowing the lawn. If we mowed a lawn for $25, if I was going to core aerate that same lawn, was $250. I 10 x and I hate that term 10 x but I 10 x that price and I got it. I got it a lot and all I'd have to do is go out and rent a core aerator for an afternoon and I'd bop out two, three yards. And I wasn't making the money on the day-to-day -day cut, but I was making the money, I was making up for it on the specialty service that I was doing. So anytime you can specialize, you're going to increase your money pond installation is another amazing way to make money and there isn't a whole lot to ponds you dig a hole you put your boulders in you understand some filtration you understand pond liner but the guys that are doing ponds have a completely different mind frame they are 
perfectionist. So when you start to look at the guys that are doing these specialty services, it starts to get away from a profit-driven center and a pride in their work. And now with category four, hardscaping, specialty services, it turns to pride. And category five coming up next is all about pride. But, but profits don't become the driving force for a lot of these guys. Profits become a side effect from the pride in their work. These guys understand their numbers. These guys understand and want to do an absolute better job. And that takes them to the next echelon, the next level. And profits become a side effect. And in category five, coming up right in a few minutes, it gets really crazy how profits are not the motivating factor. So without wasting more time, let's dive into category five. Now I started this video out by telling you that there was a company that started from zero and went to a B billion in nine years. And that company, I promise you, I was gonna tell you who it was, is actually Eagle. And here's, you're gonna, don't, don't jump off because the story gets really good. Category five is not about being ego. Category five is about inventing and creating and marketing and selling a unique product to the green industry. The guys at Ego are perfectionists. The guys at Toro, I've gone behind the scenes of Ego. I've gone behind the scenes of Toro and Steel, and I don't say this to brag. I've gone behind the scenes and toured all of Milwaukee's plants like five different times. They are freaking driven by the need for perfection. They don't even care. It gets to a point where they don't even care. And I'm not even gonna talk about big companies. I'm talking about there's these, these guys that create a product have a different mind frame. They want to create the absolute best version of this product. Let's take this down a notch and let's not talk about these giant corporations that are doing this because it's no different, but let's take this down a notch and analyze a smaller company, CMP Attachments, Derek, Andrew, these guys over there create a phenomenal product. But when I've talked to them, I do not get the sense that they care about making tons of money. All they really want to do is create the next best thing they possibly can or improving the thing they've made or making it better over and over and over again. It becomes so apparent that as I talk to companies from big to little that have created a product, it's not about profit. So if you want to, if you've got a great idea on how to make a widget and you just are going to make that widget to make the absolute most money possible, your motivator is probably wrong because it takes a ton of heart, a ton of passion, a ton of dedication to get that widget perfected, to get that widget built, to get that widget marketed, to get that widget to the audience. And if all you wanna do is make money during it, it's a long, slow road before it's a skyrocketing road up because once you've made the perfect thing and you put all these things in, into place, it's like birthing your own baby. You have a certain amount of pride in this thing you created and you just want to make it better and better and better. And you become so driven about making the absolute best thing you possibly can that making profits aren't your motivator. They don't, you don't even care anymore. It just happens. And these guys, like these guys that make Ego, I know these guys, I know the team that makes Ego. I know the entire development team. I know the owners of Ego. I know the guys that brought it to North America. They're all friends of mine. They just are driven by making it better that they possibly can last year. The same thing with Milwaukee Tools. It's phenomenal. And I went behind the scenes with Toro over and over again. And I don't know why Toro doesn't allow me to show you guys their testing facility. It's the size of my entire field enclosed in a building and they take apart everybody's equipment. They take apart, they buy every piece of equipment out there. 
They have technicians that just pull everything apart. They've got rooms that tilt tables where it tilts the equipment, sees how far before their equipment will fall over. They then put it into an oven and bake their equipment and run it till it blows up. Then they take that same piece of equipment out and they put it into a freezer and run it and see what parts will fail. The engineering team from all of these major companies that you guys see are driven to perfection. They're trying to create something amazing. And that goes from big to little. The heart of an inventor is in the perfection of his product. And profits become a side margin. So if you really want to make the absolute most money in the green industry, it's about inventing, marketing, and selling a product. But the odd factor is the guys that are doing this the absolute best are not necessarily just sheerly driven by profits. And yeah, you know, some of the big companies are. They're absolutely, because they've got teams doing it. But I'm talking about the small dogs, like CMP attachments, like uh, Arctic snowplows over here. Um, you know, these guys, I know the family, the Arctic family. And yeah, they like making money, but they're, they're, when I talk to them, it's not about making money. It's about what's their, how they're going to make their product better next year, what they've got in development. You see this plow right here? I knew about this plow for five years before anybody knew about this plow. It was green, it was weird, and, and it worked. And they developed that thing for five years before they would ever show it to anybody else in the entire world. So it's about a weird, odd drive that takes these guys to the absolute next level but that's my top did what did i miss worst is is cutting grass lawn mowing making tall grass short just doing that it's a race to the bottom second worst at least in my neck of the woods is demolition third is general excavation it starts to get better with specialty excavation it gets really good when you create a niche surface like niche niche service like digging a pond doing hardscaping core aeration dethatching that things so that ties back into lawn care and then it gets really good the profits get insane when you invent something i mean i'm looking around and i see inventors everywhere like these guys at boss trailers here's another phenomenal story these guys were farmers and they needed a fuel trailer and they couldn't afford the fuel trailers that were out there so they built a better fuel trailer dedicated toward farmers, toward making something hyper affordable. This is, see, this is where these stories, these guys, it's a different mind frame when you become an inventor, you're birthing your baby. But that's it for this one. What did I miss? What did you guys think? Lay it on me, but that's all. God bless, go get them.